swear, officer, I'm just watching Freaker and nothing else. Also, please ignore that pepper mill over there. We opened on a shot of Oishina Town that we really should have gotten in the first episode just to see this insane architecture. I mean, just what the hell? It's split into three areas with some needlessly similar buildings between their respective districts, thus making the giant monarchy Neko in the middle stand out more. Also, that thing better turn into a monster by the end of the series. Anyway, after we got a little recap done by both Yui and the narrator for whatever reason, we cut to the former, noticing that they were out of carrots for the curry she was planning on making for dinner. And through a nice little narration, Yui explained how she wanted to help her busy mother by relieving her of some of her normal cooking duties in a touching moment showing how much she just loved her mother. Or at least that should have been the case, but... <laughs> Actually, you know what? We should totally make a counter of that. We'll do it every time the narrator needlessly explains something. So, kinda two from last week plus this, we'll start with a nice little three. Let's see how high we can get by the end of this series. Also, yes, the intro subtitles were still around for everyone, except Yui for whatever reason. Hopefully that's a sign that they are at least slowly moving away from that stuff. Though, to be fair, we did kind of need them for the introduction of the second fairy partner of this series. Okay, who put Kyubei Yagyu in charge of naming these things? But yeah, he mailed a window cure queen of the blue sky was able to talk, unlike her friend, who I guess in dog years she was older than. Oh, and she also gave Laura's obnoxiousness a run for its money. Though the pooch also knew how to operate their product placement, so she gave Komi Komi a lot of food and oh. No, that's a bad deviant art. Bad, bad. All of this, of course, made the dog look like the spirit partner, while the now established toddler fairy couldn't even stand up. This very thankfully led to a scene with no narration as the fox fairy contemplated what she could do to regain her parent, I mean, partner's attention. And again, little stuff like this where we just see her arms reaching out to Yui both gets us into the head of the little fox and speaks so many more volumes than any pointless narration ever could. This is the kind of visual storytelling I want to see in this franchise. Anyway, Komi Komi grabbed Yui's shopping list and left as everyone fawned over Edward Wong called Papalu to Frisky the Fourth. Meanwhile, the lair of the bundles, they planned their next course of action. <laughs> Lady, do you even know what franchise you're in? But yeah, Secretor just kind of decided on their next target, mostly based on her preferences. Well, as Grandma once said, Also, yes, I think I found my new once per episode gag, especially after I remembered how much that show also obsessed over food. We didn't cut over to that one girl from last week who I guess was just gonna stick around for no particular reason. Anyway, Kokune here just ran to Komi Komi, got these names, and I guess just assumed that a tiny fox was somehow a dog that could stand on two legs and pull a straw basket triple its size because... The answer is don't think about it! But yeah, she found Yui's list and bought the carrots for her, which I'm just gonna assume the little fox would have shoplifted like she tried to do in the first episode. And to her credit, Kokune tailed the little fairy to make sure it got back to its owner and ended up seeing it float away. And on top of that... That was dramatic. And she ended up hearing Princess Angelina, Contessa Luisa, Francesca, Banana Fan of Obesca III talk when she said she saw Komi Komi. This, of course, was digging her deeper into the pre-cure hole, especially after a little meeting with Yui and Rosemary. Back with Komi Komi, an ill-advised shortcut got her lost in the woods where- Oh god, is that the crow from Vivid Red? I will never get tired of using that clip. Meanwhile, our resident food Instagrammer was partaking in some not so good looking curry. I mean, I don't know, just compared to all of the other food prawn in this show, this just doesn't look all that good. I mean, on top of a sunny side up egg on curry being blasphemy in my opinion, the actual protein on it didn't look too good. I mean, I won't say anything, but just don't watch Azazel Sun if you ever want to eat beef curry ever again. Huh? 
You see what I mean? No, of course, it was because Gentle had absorbed the little curry fairy, though considering this was more likely just for the Japanese variant of the dish, I wouldn't say it's a big loss. Seriously, the real Indian stuff is awesome. But yeah, our main protagonist was alerted to this, and was fortunately quickly reunited with her partner thanks to Takumi. This led to an admittedly touching little reunion between the two, but that was quickly sidelined as they needed to deal with Gentle, who I would imagine could have easily gotten away considering how much time had passed. But judging by what she says here, and the fact that she stole a pot to turn into a monster of the week, suggested that she wanted to deal with Yui permanently, though she might also have to deal with someone else starting next week. Anyway, the fight this week was pretty good, I especially like some of Yui's creativity here when she decided to take the monster on from the inside, which also kind of meant she was punching the poor thing's innards. Though the best part for me was probably this. <laughs> hmm, we could go with the classic you spin me right round reference, but I'll always prioritize the JoJo references. <laughs> Still, she didn't need to break any laws of physics to defeat this thing, forcing Gentle to have to get some takeout instead. Afterwards, they checked in on Kokune, who had passed out, probably because of a seizure from the delicious field, so Yui offered to Princess carry her home. <laughs> to anyone who was worried the show would be too hetero. From there, they went home to make the curry, while the narrator explained almost every step of the process. Thankfully, this was quickly overshadowed by the fact that Kome Kome digivolved into her in training form. And apparently, this was an ability exclusive to her because main character fairy, basically making the fox the Gamma Mod of the show. Seriously, four champion forms so far? But yeah, an interesting development that hopefully will lead to a more fleshed out fairy partner because god knows we're due for at least one this season. And the episode seemingly ended with some okayish narration as Yui ate with all of her friends, but then we went silent as we cut over to Kokune eating alone. Okay, now that's a good usage of a kind of pointless narrator. This was another solid enough episode, maybe even better than last week just for the world building. The fight was certainly good, and we even got a decent introduction to the second fairy partner of the season, and I'll even say some of my pet peeves from the last episode were kind of addressed. I mean, the subtitles are still intrusive, but the narration wasn't quite as bad. That said, we are just gonna keep track of that little counter, plus I kind of want a running gag. Kome Kome is a good example of why I consider the concept of less is more very important to visual narratives. Even after digivolving, her vocabulary remained limited, and yet in episodes like this, she was arguably the most expressive character throughout. This was emphasized thanks to the introduction of Inga Kakuru, how could this name be any longer or more pompous than it already is Kurain the Third, or rather Pom Pom, sorry, it took me a while to remember her name. And while she mostly served as a means of generating conflict for Kome Kome, she was also a fun character, being a lot more pompous than your average fairy partner, which might contrast well with a certain someone, though we'll save talking about that for another time. Still, thanks to her, the little fox's journey to become a bear partner felt a lot more relatable, as we've all kind of been in that position where the older person, like a sibling, stood up more in the eyes of the parent. And again, it was mostly told to us with no dialogue or narration and just little visual cues. I love stuff like this. I really do hope this is a sign that I won't have to use that counter as much, as this, plus some decent fights, is what attracts me to this franchise. So overall, another good, if pretty great episode, highlighting some development for a fairy, as well as foreshadowing future developments. If you haven't seen it yet, I actually managed to get the second part of this Dojisha review out, and I was surprised at how much I was able to get away with. Yeah, not to jump the gun too quick, but I was able to show pretty much all of the Yuri in this book, and while I'm not going to show it here because I do want you to go watch the review, I will say if anything, it's a fun little what-if story and a decent appetizer until we get the official manga by the Kamikita Futago. So with that done, I will work on other projects like the actual overview for this series, though since I did delay it, it also means a certain crossover film is going to be coming out this week on Blu-ray. Now of course, that film will get its own separate review first, but now we can also factor into my overall thoughts of Tropical Rouge, which should be a little bit complicated to say the least. So look forward to it. Until then though, for now my friends, and um, hold on. Hello?
Да. What do you mean? 